Okay, how's this sound? Approach to the patient with an upper respiratory infection. Am I getting, was that kind of what you guys were looking for? All right, so, so this is really, like I said, the slides, and I, and I do want you guys to jump in and, and have questions. It, it, this is such a huge topic, and, and I, you know, what I want to do is be with you in the clinic, because if you're doing urgent care, this is a large percentage of who you're going to see, right? I have a sore throat, a runny nose, what's wrong with me? Um, and, what, and, and the thing is, is this used to be a slam dunk as a, as a lecture, but now in the era of COVID is a whole other layer to it, right? That you have to be thinking about if you're on the front line. So that'll come in later, but I'm gonna start with some general stuff if I can start. So let's just start with the context. Upper respiratory infections, which means it's not pneumonia, that's a lower respiratory infection or the upper um, symptoms typically maybe a cough, a lot of nasal, ear, or throat symptoms. Most of them are caused, and this is, I say this partly because um, part of your job when you're seeing patients is to try to educate them along the way. Most URIs are caused by viruses, not bacteria, because you could say that 10 times to somebody and they'll say, well, am I going to get an antibiotic, right? It's like, well, um, antibiotics don't treat bacteria. And then you think, I've got 10 minutes before the next patient. Do I want to go down that path? Um, you do, um, because, because even though it would probably take you 10 seconds to write a prescription for an antibiotic and 10 minutes to explain why you shouldn't give them an antibiotic to the patient, you guys are part of the front line of responsibility for what we call antibiotic stewardship. Antibiotics, if we overuse them, become useless and bacteria become resistant. So get your, get your speech ready. I have one. Most upper respiratory infections are caused by viruses, not bacteria. Um, regardless of the virus, adenovirus or a coronavirus, not the current one, a cold virus, a lot of the symptoms are the same. And it's actually very hard to tell which is which uh, based on symptoms alone, and patients will tell you stories for days. I had, I went to this doctor, and I was better in three days after they gave me that that pink stuff or that you know. So just be ready because this is a um, this is a part of what you're doing in this clinic is educating people and helping to steward the use of antibiotics in countries like in, in India. For instance, the rates of resistant bacteria are incredibly high. They have some very difficult to treat bacterial infections because people were just using antibiotics like um, chewing gum or something. I mean, they were giving it out and that, that is a big problem. So we have these super bugs and super resistance because people haven't been stewarding the use of antibiotics. So that's my soapbox about antibiotics. I'll talk about that some more. I don't know why my thing, my slides are not advancing. There we go. All right, so let's talk about the common symptoms of an upper respiratory infection. In, in the, three, the three buckets that I like to think about, allergies, a real upper respiratory infection, or a more serious upper inf a respiratory infection from the flu. And Hopefully you're seeing decent vaccination rates in your areas, but not, not a lot. So the other thing you want to ask, sorry, this isn't, the other thing you want to ask your patients is have they had a flu shot, right? Because that'll tell you how much or how little you need to worry about the flu. Um, as you guys probably know, the flu vaccines are developed every year based on worldwide surveillance of flu A and flu B strains and the ones that are traveling around the population and the ones that are most likely to cause people to be sick. Itchy, watery eyes, very common in allergies. You, don't, you hear a little bit less about that with upper respiratory infections. A lot of times people with flu or, or more serious viral infections will say, well, my eyes just kind of feel dry or funny or it, 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 they're sort of sore and achy. It's a weird thing. Nasal discharge is not going to distinguish one from the other. A lot of people will have drippy noses with any of these. Nasal congestion, much less common in the flu um, than it is in just an allergic uh, situation, somebody who has seasonal allergies. And a lot of times the seasonal allergy people will just have like a fountain. I mean, they'll just really have a lot of watery nasal discharge. Um, so it, it, not always, but sometimes they do. 
and I that, that sometimes is a clue for me, but all of them can have nasal discharge. Um, sore throat, um, a lot of times with an allergy, the sore throat is really from post-nasal drip. That's what the PND is. And so when they're, if that's a big component or if they say, yeah, the such, such and such is blooming or everybody in my family has allergies or I can't have cats or something like that, you, you might wanna think about based on their history, uh, you know, is this an alert, is this somebody who tends to be allergic? Sore throat is less common in allergies, uh, upper respiratory infection, if you, you guys have had them, it's very common. A little bit less common with the flu. What about cough? Everybody can cough um, much. It depends on how bad the post-nasal drip is and with an allergy person, very common in upper respiratory infections, usually pretty mild, just annoying. Another thing is people say, well, I took this and it didn't get better in a day. And people are very impatient. I mean, a lot of it is just saying, look, it's gonna take time to get over your cold. In the flu, um, and, and by the way, the, the cough is generally non-productive. If you see somebody who's further out from a respiratory infection, which you thought sounded like a typical viral infection, <clears throat> and now on the other side of it, they're not getting better, but getting worse and having high fevers and a productive cough, what you might have is a scenario where somebody had a viral infection, didn't, you know, and didn't really get better because what happened is they got a secondary bacterial infection. So look for that, the sort of didn't bounce back um, upper respiratory infection, be thinking about that. Headache, um, sometimes with allergies, depending on how much they have in the way of sort of um, nasal passage congestion. It's actually fairly rare in respiratory infections, but you know, when people feel bad, they put everything in there in the list of complaints. Very common in the flu. Fever, we just don't see fever with allergies. That's why we need vital signs and that's why it's important to know. And people will say, well, I felt hot. Yeah, and that's how they say it in Alabama. I felt hot or I'm sure I had a fever or yeah, I've been feverish. Who knows what that means? Get the data, be sure you get their vital signs when they come in. Um, URI, fever is pretty rare in adults, kids. And I'm gonna talk mostly about adults, by the way. I didn't know if you guys were seeing kids at all. Um, pretty rare in adults, very common fevers with the flu and with um, other viral infections, AKA COVID. Fatigue and weakness, sometimes just people with allergies who aren't sleeping um, will just be tired. Uh, sometimes with the URI. Flu, if you've had it, a flu-like illness, it, you, you feel terrible, you have fevers, everything aches. That's the other thing that can be very distinguishing about the flu. And um, much less so with allergies, maybe sometimes with the URI. And then the duration, um, cold symptoms, upper respiratory infections that are mostly benign can go on for up to a couple of weeks. And commonly that cough, if they have it, it's very annoying, but, and it can persist for a while because they're a little bronchospastic. So I'm gonna talk about just a couple of things. There's a, there, this differential for an upper respiratory anything is huge, but I just wanna talk about a couple of high points. Vir viral nasopharyngitis. Okay, so even though somebody with the common cold is just complaining about all kinds of things, um, you know, I focus usually, if I think it's just a regular cold, if I'm gonna examine them, if you look in their nose, um, that's actually worth doing. You'll often see that it's red and swollen. The other thing I, I, the way I try to look at these when you think, oh my gosh, somebody else with a cold, and, and you don't want to do the exam, but here's where you are in your careers. What you want to do is increase your denominator. Every nose you look in, every set of lungs you listen to increases your background of who you've seen, right? And you, what you're trying to do is gain experience. So I worked at a walk, I've worked at many walk-in clinics when I was moonlighting and in my training and in, and in urgent care clinics. Um, and I just sort of thought, well, this is my chance to really see a lot of patients and examine them. And many of them will have pretty normal findings, but it's a, but it's just think of it as a learning. And then that way, when you're annoyed and exhausted, at least you're getting something out, out of it in terms of your own experience. So look in the nose. Um, I mentioned that nasal discharge is much more characteristic of a viral than a bacterial infection. People who have bacterial sinusitis are stuffed up. They don't usually have discharge and they have, can have sinus tenderness and pain. The other thing um, when you are thinking about pharyngitis, just inflammation in the nose or back and in here in the back of the throat, 
it's actually very hard to distinguish viral pharyngitis. And people say, well, I had that white patch. <laughs> I had that white patch, so it must be strep. Actually, other infections of pharyngitis can cause that, um, can cause an exudate. But if you're thinking about strep, and there is a rapid test you can do if that's in your differential, you've got somebody who's had a high fever and you're, or you're more worried about it, um, you can get a test. But the first thing is examine them. Um, they not only will have redness, but they may have the exudates. Importantly, they're, they're febrile generally, and they'll have tender uh, cervical nodes when you examine them. So that's a way if you're, if you're worried about missing that, just focus on that part of the exam. A question? Yes, please. Let's stop. Uh, so uh, can we go over what causes exudates and um, sore throat? Like mono would be another in the differential? Yeah, the, I, I didn't. I did, you know, like I said, this would be pretty exhaustive. I think that the things I think about are mononucleosis. Um, you know, there are some other bacterial, particular bacterial infections that can cause the exudates on the, on the, on the tonsils in the back of the let me come back to that because I think that's a good question. And I, I don't have, I may have it in one of my slides, but I think the question is what causes exudates? And, and there are some specific things. I tried to focus on the thing, you know, the things you worry about missing in the big buckets, but I'll come back to that. So that was kind of a, but that's a good question. I just wrote that down. So I wanna talk about epiglottitis. This is one of the things I always was afraid of. And epiglottitis, you'll see it more in kids and it literally is inflammation of the epiglottis. And I just remember when I was taught, like if you think somebody has epiglottitis, do not, do not, put, <laughs> do not put anything in their mouth and try to take a good hard look at the back of their throat because you could trigger spasm. And one thing you can do on patients where you suspect this is that you can get a lateral chest x-ray, a, a lateral neck x-ray, and you can actually see thickening of the epiglottis if you need that. But so, so this is just a don't touch, right? If you think that they might have it, um, you want to be very thoughtful about whether you put a tongue depressor in the back of their mouth. So actually, what is epiglottitis? It's just inflammation. What do these patients look like? Um, they're drooling. They're actually, they're having trouble swallowing. Um, they may have a voice change. If you hear any strider or something like something's not sounding right with their airway, um, you should be concerned. They may have a cough. Um, they may be tender uh, externally. Any signs of respiratory distress. Um, you this is just one of those cases where you want to know like, well, if, if it's not everything else and it might be this, I need to, I need to triage this patient. Um, it, it's, it's not, I'm not saying it's very common, but it's just one of those things where I think you need to be on the lookout. I mean, a lot, you know, common things are common, but occasionally, as you know, I'm sure all of you, and I wanna hear more about your experience, people will walk in the door of an urgent care clinic who probably need to walk right into the ER instead of into your clinic. So laryngitis and laryngeotracheitis, that's just again inflammation of the larynx and then actually down into the trachea. Um, there are people who might, like kids will have croup. Um, they actually are, are less ill than they sound. They can sound terrible. They're honking. The whooping cough is one of the things I, 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 I haven't spent a lot of time preparing for today, but that's one thing to think about. Hoarseness usually tells you that they've got laryngitis. Um, that just means inflammation there. If you're, if you're again, if you're hearing strider, inspiratory wheezes, anything that you think, uh-oh, I'm worried that their upper airway is compromised or swollen, um, then you want to pause a minute. If you want to see if you can, you can't hear it. Obviously, just looking at them, you can gently place the stethoscope over the anterior part of the trachea as they inspired. If you, if you get that sense you're hearing a narrowing or something that's not right, um, that should trigger further examination. So like I said, in terms of a workup, I just, I, I, this is such a huge topic. I thought I'd, I'd focus on some your questions and, and some of the things. So I've already mentioned epiglottitis, which is a special case. Um, you might be wondering why I'm focusing on this because it happened to me. <laughs> it's, it's usually I was in an urgent care, um, and the and the nurse says, "Oh, this guy he just he's lost his voice," um, and he came in and he was leaning leaning forward, which is another thing, and he was drooling. 
And um, I thought, well, this is kind of weird. And um, he was just about to swell his airway shut. And um, fortunately, um, I got I got him to the right place, but I was I, I almost blew it by not recognizing. And the nurse was going to blow him off and tell him to come back tomorrow. So live and learn. Um, most viruses that cause upper respiratory infection, there is no therapy. Um, if somebody's uncomplicated and not very sick, I, I don't think there's a reason to viral test. However, you guys are living in an era where we're doing viral testing right now, right, when we need it. Um, importantly, if you know they have a virus, like the flu, then <laughs> you're not going to give antibiotics to a viral infection, right? Some people I mentioned can go from a viral infection to a bacterial infection. You want to look out for that. But in general, um, you know, first, before you get the test, think what you're going to do with the information. Um, like I mentioned again on the third bullet, if people are having symptoms lasting longer than 14 days and there's no other reason to explain it, like it's just an asthma flare or a lot of postnasal drip, start thinking whether or not they might have a secondary bacterial inspection, especially in vulnerable people. So I don't know what you guys have in the clinics. Usually you're going to have this rapid flu test. Um, you're going to have a rapid strep test. There are ways to confirm bacterial versus viral things. Um, you can usually get a, a flu test from nasopharyngeal swabs, washes, or aspirates. I, can, I have a whole spiel to talk about testing for COVID, if that's something you guys have a question about at the end. I didn't include it here, but I'm happy to talk about it. Um, okay, I, I'm sorry, go ahead, please. Sorry, the, the testing for the flu, like we don't rely on it because it's so bad. <laughs> I think it was influenza B. There's one of them that's a really like false negative rate. If you could speak to that. Um, yeah, which do you know which test? Um, it's a rapid flu test. Do you know which company makes it? Oh I, no, I'm so sorry. I don't. No, that's okay. I think that you know I like your your um, question in terms of understanding testing a little bit, which is its whole other. So if you so this is the debate that's been going on where I think people just don't you know don't get it about. It, it takes a while. Let me just say, it takes a while to understand it. So the first test that was available for COVID is a PCR test. The PCR test is very, very sensitive. If there's one piece of dead gene product from a dead virus, it will pick it up, okay? So it's extremely sensitive. If you've got a patient in front of you and you wanna know whether or not they have COVID, the PCR is a, good, is a good test. Now, depending on where they are in their illness, um, their viral load, they may not have been shedding the virus to the point or they may be on the other side of it. But for an individual patient, a PCR test is good. If you're going into a nurse, let's say you went to visit your cousin who had some kids and they were in school and you're thinking, well, one of them had a runny nose and had a fever. And I wonder, you know, if I should um, be worried about that or if I'm going to go into a congregate setting like a nursing home. So, a, a PCR, um, I, I would say an antigen test, which is coming out, which is what the flu tests are now, a rapid antigen test, it's less sensitive. It takes more, it can miss if it can miss it. So, so the, basically the, the, the characteristics you're thinking about of your test is how sensitive is it or not? If I'm doing the whole Alabama football team twice a week in practice, I just wanna know if any of them are infectious. There might be an individual who actually has COVID, but is not likely to be infectious. So a less sensitive test is fine, right? So flu test, um, you don't, we don't worry about the infectiousness of the flu, but because we need it a rapid turnaround, we sacrifice a little bit of the sensitivity for the fact that it's a fast test. So in that case, I mean, you have to figure, again, you always have to stop and think, what is it that I'm going to learn from this test that's going to change my management or not? Always do that before you order a test. And I think if you think it walks like the flu and looks like the flu and it is the flu, um, then the pretest probability of the, of the flu test being positive is pretty high. If you don't think it's the flu, but it's a relatively insensitive test, um, then it, you, could, you, know, you could just be wasting your time. So, I mean, it's the setting in which you order it as well as the performance characteristics of the test. I don't know if that's, we're kind of going down a rabbit hole, but I would just say that, that no test is perfect. 
you either are willing to accept in that situation, are you, the risk, are you willing, if you've got a patient in front of you who thinks have COVID, are you more concerned about a false positive or a false negative? You're more concerned about a false negative, right? Because you think the patient has COVID. So in that case, you want a test that's so sensitive, it picks up every little scrap of any possibility of PCR, right? If you're, in, if you're in a situation where you're just trying to figure out if somebody on this, foot, this football team is infectious and they're healthy and they're probably not gonna be sick, you might say, well, <clears throat> this guy was sick two months ago and he's, for whatever reason, he's, the PCR is still picking up gene product in his nose. I don't really wanna know that. I just wanna know whether he's gonna infect other people or not. So <clears throat> I know when I was in medical training, I just couldn't wait to get through statistics. I hated it. I hated it with a passion. <clears throat> but let me tell you, if you're going to be triaging people and thinking about how to use tests smartly, just go back to that ugh, true, pe you know, that TPR, true, learn sensitivity and specificity and learn a little bit about the characteristics of the test you order. It will serve you in good stead in every other situation that you're in. And it also, again, is part of your job. Part of your job is to educate the public. And um, you may not be able to go into a long discussion about testing with them, but they want tests, they want antibiotics, they want the brain scan, they want all of it, some of them. And you've got to learn to be able to use the resources you have wisely. And sometimes you're going to have to explain to people why they're not going to get antibiotics or they're not going to get it. So that's my, that's another soapbox. And I'm not sure I completely answered your question, but you can, you can ping me at the end. Um, so I'm going to move on because I really, I really am interested in, in these cases and things that you guys have got. So we talked about sampling. Um, okay, chest x-rays, do not get them for the common cold. If you're going to get, again, same principle, why am I getting a chest x-ray? What am I going to do with what I find? I always do the exercise like if it's clear, what does that do for me? If it's got an infiltrate or something, what does that do for me? Um, I spend a lot of time seeing people who have, somebody has ordered a CT scan on of the chest for weird reasons, and there's a pulmonary nodule. And then I got to go work up because, you know, if you look for it and you find it, then you own it. Now we have to figure out whether or not that's something to worry about or how to follow it up. So just think about it. Likewise, I don't think blood tests are particularly useful unless you've, you know, I would just say what you want to do when you're ordering tests, do not be on a fishing expedition, throwing a line in the water and see what bites. I want you to be on a hunting expedition. I think it's this, I'm gonna take this out, I'm gonna take aim at it and I'm gonna order some tests skillfully. Hunting, not fishing. You can fish though when you're really stumped and you've got a sick patient in front of you and you, you, you just can't figure it out. A sick patient trumps a lot of my advice here. If you think they look poorly, go with your clinical judgment, keep going. So URIs, my, my big picture is most people diagnose it themselves, they treat it at home and they're done. A lot of the, there are patients who worry and come in with every little thing and there are people who come in when they're on death's door. And I don't know why, but some people just, you know, there's a range. So you've got to make an assessment when they, when you see them in the clinic. If somebody, with, and, and part of that assessment, by the way, is wondering how vulnerable they are medically. And we didn't even get into the medical history, but I'm assuming you guys always contextualize it. Like, you know, this is a 25 year old healthy, you know, surfer or something. This is a 60 year old who smokes and has multiple medical problems. You're alert, you know, you're gonna change your, your meter for what you're concerned about um, based on the patient in front of you. And you're going to get that information by looking at them and talking to them and looking at their med list and their past medical history. So a lot of patients with URI just need reassurance. I mentioned education and symptomatic instructions for symptomatic home treatment. I, I would imagine a lot of clinics will just have a standard. You just have a cold, do this, come back. If you see this, they get instructions. Testing for specific path pathogens is helpful only when the, there's a therapy that depends on the results. And um, that's about as detailed as I was gonna get about um, specific pathogens. Okay, I've been on my soapbox about antibiotics. Um, you don't give them unless you know they have a bacteria. You generally like to be on a hunting expedition and know which bug or at least cover for the most common bugs. There's wonderful guidelines by many societies about prescribing antibiotics. Consider the risks and the benefits. 
um, and um, treat the other really important position thing is we've learned over the years we can treat people for a much shorter duration this sort of seven to 14 days which was like the normal when I was you know in training it's more like five to seven depending on how, how sick you think they are and where their infection is all right I'm gonna pause there and then I'm gonna talk about URIs in the COVID epidemic um, and see what because let me let me just ask you guys how how many I mean what percentage you guys could just show of people coming into the clinics and I know right now it's different have upper respiratory symptoms in your clinic just you can you guys can shout out a number five ten nine I would say seventy five percent of our patients walk in are upper respiratory okay somebody else URIs how much of your business is it. Don't be shy. Come on. How the last you? the last few weeks, I would say probably 85 to 90 percent. Wow. Okay, somebody else. Because now I'm gonna have to do a second talk. I can hear it. Well, lower for us, but we do everything like OB and yeah. What's yours in Boston in the clinic you're in, just for comparison? Oh, and so it's actually Lawrence, Massachusetts, a half an hour north. Yeah. So what was your question? What's the percentage of URIs walk in your clinic as the diag likely diagnosis? Well, I mean, it varies on the season. And I would say right now for me, it's like maybe 25%. Okay. But, um, but it's again, because we see everything. Like yeah. Family. Okay. Anybody else want to throw out a number? Yeah, I was going to say it's probably pretty low for where I'm at. A, I'm at a FQHC family practice as well. So you're seeing uh, a difference. Like 20% maybe. 20%. But we also have a drive through clinic too that if people have any symptoms, we do. So that, that's, that's yeah. Big I think the difference is, is and, and this is something I want to, I'm curious about is that right now, I know in San Francisco, if you have respiratory symptoms, you go to a different clinic um, because of the concern about COVID. Are, are the ones that are seeing all these URIs, uh, anybody, are those um, just walk-in clinics and there's no triage if they might have COVID or what's going on? To, I mean, are people getting, doing questions before they come to you and you guys are in PPE when you see them or what, what's the situation? For us, it's pretty sensitive for HIPAA, but we like the receptionist to find out as much as they can about their URI symptoms without, you know, imposing. Yeah. Is the, is the receptionist screened and masked when they come in? We have a glass wall currently. Okay. So I guess you could say that. Yeah. And are the patients, what percentage of the patients already have a mask on? Zero? <laughs> no, I would say, I would say the majority of them, but ironically, okay. it seems like the ones who are genuinely COVID suspicious don't wear them. So it's yeah, almost like they're more it's ironic, aloof. isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it is. Anybody, anybody else? Uh, how about in Tuscaloosa? What's the URI or, or in the in that area? I think there was somebody. I know you were from there, but I think there was somebody also in a clinic there. Or did I mishear that? Or Auburn or near that area? Any college campus nearby? It's like eighty to ninety percent in the urgent care setting in Tuscaloosa. Wow. Yeah, so this is, and and the really important point coming in from Boston is that it's more seasonal in the Northeast, right? We know when, when people are inside cold weather that there's more transmission, so um, great. So that's really great. You know, that's fascinating context, which makes me feel better about talking about COVID because I, I talk about it all the time in lectures and stuff, but I wanted to try to make this really, I, I hope more what you guys wanted um, so this is, this is uh, old wisdom from the days of uh, my days when it was HIV and I was a medical student in Atlanta and literally while I was there uh, as a student, um, you know, and I, it was also this kind of weird macho, like I don't need to put gloves on. It's like, well, wait a minute, you know, when I draw blood or anything. And then all of a sudden it was like, okay, this is here. And the only sensible, you can't look at somebody, you can't smell them, you can't figure out what their name is and figure out whether they're HIV positive, right? You just couldn't. So treat everybody <clears throat> with a URI right now 
as if they might have COVID. That from a public health standpoint and from your own safety and the safety of your clinic is the advice I, I would give. Just assume until proven otherwise that they're COVID positive and act accordingly in, in a patient with a URI. Now, some things that might be retrospectively reassuring because I, I was exposed to HIV many times, needle sticks and things like that. And I of course would go over and over in my mind, um, did I miss something? Could I have known? Well, the, the fact of the matter is you can't know. So just be smart about it. So I act as if every patient with upper respiratory infection symptoms right now could potentially have COVID. If they come in and say, I have it, but I already had a test. I mean, if you have other information, great. But where you guys are, you are literally the front lines. You do not know enough about people walking and you don't know who they're hanging out with. You don't know who they spent Friday night with. You don't know anything about where, and, and people come and say, well, I'm, I have a cold, but it's not COVID. You heard, has anybody heard that? I know it's not COVID. And I think this is a particularly male affliction. I'm just gonna put this out there. Like somehow guys just know it's not COVID. <clears throat> they will argue, I'm like, wow, you are just smarter than me because you know it's not COVID. Your job is not to let, is not to fall into their trap of whatever their magical thinking is, okay? So, so you're in the clinic and I don't know, have, have any of you tested positive for COVID or been tested for it? Let me just ask that. Or are you getting tested? I've been tested, but I tested negative. Yeah. And was that based on a work exposure or based on a, another exposure situation? Another exposure situation. Yeah. So the fact of the matter is testing is what's going to get us out of this in the sense of how can we, how can we be sane and do our jobs and go back to whatever somewhat sense, you know, and, and I think that testing has come a long way. It was, first of all, <clears throat> the PCRs were slower. To, if, if a test takes more than three days, it's useless unless you can stay home or the person can stay home and not be with anybody else. What we need is, is more testing for everybody all the time. And if you imagine like our son is a first grade school teacher and he's still doing distance learning and he's and he has two a newborn twins. So he's trying to figure out how do I decrease the likelihood that I'm gonna be bring something home to my family? What's a surveillance plan like in a school? And you've probably heard about the NBA bubble, right? And other um, uh, sports teams that are, that are doing this or not doing it. Um, and how are they doing that? Generally, they're, and, and how are people, there are people going back to work. Um, besides the usual safety precautions at work, I know a place where they're getting, people are getting tested twice a week to see if they're contagious or not. And they're getting either rapid turnaround PCR, they're getting antigen testing, depending on the situation. So I would just say that, um, again, you know, testing is, is, is something that we need more of, and I'm sure, I don't know, can you guys tell me, is testing, is rapid COVID testing available in the facilities where you work? I mean, rapid being in a day or so, or even less, do you know? We had rapid 15 minute tests, but we're running out of them so quickly that we're not getting them back in quick enough to keep them. Yeah, well, that's too bad because you need more of those, right? And you need right. them all the time. And I would guess is 15 minutes is probably the antigen test, which is fine. If you've got a, we'll come back to that. I think that's, it. and what's gonna happen and what is happening, you know, they have those, flu, they have those respiratory viral panels um, where you can, they're gonna incorporate um, COVID into those panels. There'll be rapid antigen testing. So you'll have that for your own selves um, or, or for an individual patient that you, if you really think somebody's sick and has it, stick to that, right? Because tests, like I said, tests aren't perfect. So let me talk a little bit about, so, so that's my act as if um, scenario. So when in doubt, assume they're positive and act accordingly. If you're concerned that they might have it um, and you can't get a test, they have to quarantine themselves and their contacts for at least 10 days after the symptom onset. 
And this has been bounced around a little bit, but I'd say some people have seven days, some say 10 days. I think what you're, what you're aiming for is 10 days after somebody might have had COVID from the, from the symptoms, it's highly unlikely they're going to be infectious. There will be people that might still be, but it's very unusual. The other thing we have said, suggested is it's been at least seven to 10 days and it's been at least 48 hours since you had a fever. And that's something we've used in the hospital. And this is where you talk about having to educate people. I can't imagine being you guys right now. You're in an environment where um, a lot of this is being unnecessarily politicized. It's just medicine. It's just public health. It's just common sense. You're going to have to, and, and if you can't get people to, you know, you can tell them what to do. Sometimes the public health departments near you can help with um, reinforcements. If the testing is available and um, you can get it, uh, you can't get it for a while, they have to quarantine them. You have to tell them to be in quarantine until you get the results. If you've got somebody in front of you, and let's say you get the rapid antigen test, which is a little less sensitive, and it's negative, and you think, well, I'm pretty sure, you know, they were with somebody in their household, test them again in three days, because it may just be that the viral load hasn't peaked yet, and it's just the test isn't detecting it. And I would, in that case, if you have a choice, do the PCR test. And then, of course, if they're, you don't, I don't know if you guys are being asked to contact Trace or what you're doing. Have, have any of you had a person who was COVID positive that came in to see you? And then what, what, what steps did you end up having to take to, to do your job? Or what were you expected to do? Anybody? We still Not care yet. for them normally. They come through a different entrance compared to the other patients, but they still go into the same rooms and we still treat them as if they came in with a, another symptom. Oh, really? Okay. And, and so, so, you, so they're walking in and, and they're just like, here's a person for urgent care and they have upper respiratory and they're not sent, treated any differently. It's just, we're gonna see them. And are you guys, do you guys have PPE, at least a mask and a, and or a face shield? Do all of you have that? Everybody, okay, just checking. And, and you said some of the, the patients, well, I guess by the time they come to see you, somebody slapped a mask on them in the clinic or no? This depends. Where we live pretty much everywhere is like, it's mandatory to wear a mask. So no okay. one can really go anywhere without wearing one. Okay, well, that's good. Is that, oh, is that that because that the governor had a mask mandate, right? Okay, well, hooray for Kay Ivy. I didn't, know, I didn't know she did that. It's not the same in a lot of other states. So let me let me let me move on. So you're going to get it. You know, if it's a political discussion about masks, just don't go there. I mean, I don't. To me, masks. It's not an. It's not an article of faith or political beliefs. Masks work. Okay, they decrease. And and depending on the type of mask, I know you guys have been educated all this you know, somebody wearing a somewhat loose fitting mask, the transmission from them to you is, or anybody else is down if they have a mask on. If you are in the COVID ICU and everybody around you has COVID, I wear an N95 that is sealed to prevent the COVID getting in to me, okay? That's it, that's the bottom line. And um, some mask is better than nothing, even though you probably know, um, Things. So, so again, you guys are in the education business as well as the caretaking. First of all, just we do. They, there was just a case or just a report of a patient who was who had flu and COVID. So that can happen. Um, if there's more than one virus, yes, you are at risk for being more sick. Um, and a severe disease is when you it's a respiratory illness. You're having trouble breathing. And then there's some risk factors for severe illness, which I'm not gonna go through because you guys have probably already thought of it. Again, education for patients. These are this COVID's a respiratory virus. Person to person, if you're in close contact, usually droplets, there's a whole debate about droplets versus aerosols, I think it's both. And if you are running, breathing hard, exercising, coughing, sneezing, singing loudly, you're going to ex exhale more and further. So those activities could be associated with spread even if you're 12 feet apart. 
You can be infected by touching hands, but it's really only if you bring your hand to your face or to your mouth or nose or eyes. And I'm sure you guys have learned like I have that if you're in medicine, you just don't do that. How do you avoid it? Um, there's lots of guidance on this. Again, you may be the only person educating that person in front of you. So take the opportunity um, about that. The flu vaccine covers A and B strains. People, <laughs> what, let's see, what are some of the things I've heard? Oh, I took the flu vaccine and it gave me the flu. Well, that's kind of right from a biologic standpoint. I mean, you give them an attenuated non-live flu vaccine and you raise an immune response. They're sore, their arm hurts. Um, anyway, you just have to, I mean, I think now more than ever, you guys should spend some time thinking about how to educate people about vaccination. We know due to COVID vaccination of children against preventable diseases is down. Um, there's been, a, there's going to be a lot of misinformation about vaccinations and the only way we're our communities and we are all going to get back to, um, I hope a different life than we have right now is through vaccination. And so we're actually looking at doing some vaccination education programs for our partners and for people like you guys, I'm meeting with the whole group of infectious disease folks to talk about that. I would just say this, I want you guys prepared to have those conversations because they're gonna come. And, sat, and, and some of the people you're seeing are gonna be prioritized because they are the most vulnerable of the population. So I, I just wanna put in a pitch a little bit for coming back to us about some vaccination education because you're gonna to have to have that elevator speech, your clinic's gonna be backed up and you're gonna to need to know what to say to try to get people on board with what you think they should be doing. Okay, avoiding, you guys have heard all this, but I, again, it's an opportunity with a patient in front of you to educate them because uh, somewhat somewhat different than my the rest of my life, um, there is this distrust of public health officials and scientists and doctors and med other medical personnel that I've never seen before. So um, you giving them good information is really, really important. All right, COVID versus the flu. I don't think there's a lot of way. I think if you think it could be one or the other, you have to act as if. I'm just gonna point out from this chart a couple of things. And this is COVID and this is the flu and we're learning about this. A Couple of things about COVID. Um, everything that you get with the flu, um, but this loss of taste and smell is really coming out as um, something that we're seeing more. It can still happen with a sinus infection another respiratory infection but it's something. The other thing um, that stands out to me, the onset of illness can, can be many days, many more days after you've been to the Thanksgiving party with your family where you found out your cousin was infected. It could be two weeks. It's usually much more rapid with the flu. So um, ask people where they've been and who they've been hanging out with if you're worried about COVID. Okay, contagiousness. Now this, is, this just makes me crazy, okay? Con the COVID is clearly way more infectious than the flu, way more infectious, okay? And you can have zero, zero symptoms and just be a spreader, right? So again, way more contagious. High risk groups, I'd say interestingly, and we can have a whole discussion on this, young children can still get COVID and can be sick, sick from it. We just aren't seeing as much as we would expect and that we see typically with the flu, okay? Complications, Some, and this comes more to the ICU and you don't have to know about this as much, but we are seeing weird coagulation disorders and blood clots and in children, the way they don't come in with a respiratory symptom, they come in with a stomach ache or diarrhea or something very unusual. So they seem to have a very different manifestation in terms of this, what we call the multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children. Recovery time, COVID, longer, more complications. Um, right now, the only treatment approved for COVID is remdesivir, which is an IV only antiviral. We originally developed for hep C and then for Ebola. It has some activity. It's been shown to decrease hospital days but it hasn't been shown to increase survival. And then of course, we're all hoping for um, vaccines and I'd be happy, I'm, I'm on a advisory panel for vaccine development and I would be happy if you're ever interested to give you an update on where all that stands. Symptoms, 
Um, so what about COVID-19 versus pneumonia? Um, usually a non-productive cough if you have it is much more common with a viral illness. Bacterial pneumonia is often, you know, wet, phlegmy, mucousy. Um, again, those typically will be a more rapid as opposed to gradual. Um, you know, bacterial infections can be contagious. We play that down, but not nothing like um, a viral illness. And um, we're more likely to see that following a viral infection in young children. Already talked about treatment. So here's, I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna stop there and then I'm gonna talk a little bit about some work in the ICU if we have time. And I'm not even sure we do because I'm not looking at my clock here. How are we doing for time there? Okay. Anybody want to have any comments? They're like, get to the end, Ramona, so we can ask questions. Okay. So look, um, if you hate wearing a mask, you're really not going to like the ventilator. That's my, that's my motto. So wh wh what do I know about this? Well, I had to go work in the COVID ICU in April. And you can see I have an N95 on. It's not a very flattering. We were dealing with some pretty pathetic um, gowns at the time. A couple of things you'll notice that we did that were just smart. The nurses really, uh, the other health personnel came up with it. You can see this is, we didn't have many negative pressure rooms which, which turn over the circulation. So we were putting um, the IV poles and everything were outside the room. So the nurses didn't have to go in as much. And we had stations for PPE at every bedside and we were all geared up. We also didn't um, go to the staff room <laughs> and have lunch together, all of that stuff, eating. I just didn't take my mask off all day. It's pretty much my, the way that I did it. A lot of the transmissions that, that did occur in the hospital, interestingly, were mostly actually people in, getting it in the community or at home or in the break room, um, much less because of precautions we normally take with patients. So why do you want to wear a mask more than a ventilator? Um, a couple of x-rays from a couple of patients I took care of, and we could do a, a session sometime on how to read chest x-rays, but these are APs, portable, so you don't get a lateral view. So the things you want to look at is, did they take, was there a deep breath? I mean, if the ribs are spread out and you can count them, that was a pretty good deep breath. If somebody doesn't take a deep breath and their, their lungs are all collapsed, they can, it can look terrible. So basically the nice thing about that's the reason I'm a pulmonologist because there's two lungs, right? So you always have something to compare it to, which makes my life a little easier. Um, these are very abnormal x-rays, normally because mostly the lungs are air and not infiltrate or inflammation or dead cells or bacteria, it's gonna be, it's gonna be dark. And this patient, and you can see areas of normal where there's air, and then you just see these diffuse both sides and, and one of the distinguishing features of COVID is that it's both lungs generally. And um, I'm sorry, I'm going to go back. So the, oops, 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 I'm going. So this is a um, this is a patient who has what I call a little bit more patchy, but you can see it's it's all over the lungs. We don't normally get CT scans, but just for reference, the CT scan you just see sort of light and dark and shadows and air and bone. Obviously, here you can see. Um, cardiac silhouette and we've this, these patients were both intubated. You see their endotracheal tubes here. Um, CT scan is, has been interesting for me because you, like I said, it's patchy. You can see areas of normal aeration and then areas where the lungs are infiltrated and, and patchy. And we call this sort of grayish that's not really super solid. We call it ground glass. This one over here is a little bit more consolidated. I couldn't tell you if that was was or wasn't a pneumonia versus um, COVID versus just atelectasis or lung collapse um, because the patient's lying on their back and that's the back part of the lung. So if you feel like you're drinking out of a fire hose trying to learn about COVID, you are. I felt this way uh, when I was an intern during the AIDS epidemic and yet it was the most, it was, it was horrible, but it was also the most formative thing. And I look back on that as really being influencing more than me more than anything else as a clinician and I know you guys are beleaguered and underwater but you're in a it's it's a crazy but a but an interesting time and I think there's a lot of opportunity for learning for you but also for education for the people that you see and um, again I'm going to talk just put up my mask slide and I'm going to I'm going to stop and then I want to talk to you guys 
see what you have for thoughts or questions. And I have no idea if this is what you needed to hear because I was kind of a little in the dark, but I'm happy to come back and do more tech lectures. But I want to hear questions or I want to hear some experiences from you guys. If you have a, a tough case, um, just one, we're at the top of the hour. They're like, no, I got to go to work. <laughs> This was great. We have, uh, you know, uh, we usually end around 11, but if you guys want to stay for just a little bit longer, okay. maybe five or 10 more minutes, we'd love to, you know, if you have questions or whatever, to bounce those off of you. So yeah, I'm really I sorry. I didn't leave more time. I I'll do that. Oh no, later. this was excellent. I, I actually have another meeting at 12, but um, 12 Eastern standard time. Yeah. I want to say, so Lawrence, um, it was a, in the spring and is now again a hot spot in Massachusetts. So, I mean, it's all, it's like the prevalence, right? So that's how we can determine whether we think it's COVID or not. So the prevalence was so high that I saw even like one of my patients, um, he had URI symptoms and fever, but he also had dysuria and hematuria and they all resolved together and he was COVID positive. And then yeah. like, you know, that's just these random things. And then like a woman had one day of sniffles and that was it and she was COVID positive. So it's just like, Everything is COVID positive. It is. It's it's the only way, the only defense right now. And you're right. Knowing the background prevalence in your community um, gives you a sense. I mean, I would not want to be moving, living in Florida or Idaho or any of those places or El Paso right now. So, yeah, good. Like I said, assume assume everyone's positive until proven otherwise. That's how you'll still stay safe and keep other people safe. I really think so. Wow. Well, good luck with that. Good luck. Thank you for, I hope this was kind of uh, helpful to you guys. I don't know. I just am so in such admiration for all of you being thrown at this point in your careers into the front line. I felt that way when I was an intern during the AIDS epidemic, when there were zero medicines, zero, and everybody died, right? So now we have drugs and it's become a chronic disease. We will get through this and we're going to have treatments for people and it's going to be better. But you guys have to set the example and educate patients. And you kind of have to spread that hope a little bit because I think some people are, are pretty down right now, including, including us, right? It's hard to be doing what we're doing right now. So do take good care of yourselves um, while you're doing this. Um, I was terrified some days as an intern and overwhelmed and emotional and, you know, and now I can look back on it and think, wow, I did that. I think you'll all look back on this and say, wow, I did it. And you should be really proud of what you're doing. It's great. Uh, they've been doing a great job entering into this during COVID. I mean, that's a huge adjustment. For, yeah, and we're here to support you guys, however we can do that. I had a quick question um, sure. that you may be familiar with, but in the South, I've noticed, so I've worked other places, but in the South, I've noticed we like to use steroids to um, address URI symptoms, whether it's an injection or um, mm -hmm. taking them orally. And I just wanted to see if there's a place for that and what you know evidence you have in terms of the use of yeah. those. For URIs, there's really no, there's no support for using steroids, okay? There's a long history for conditions with lung inflammation for using steroids. For instance, in the early days of HIV with pneumocystis pneumonia, we had a raging debate about could steroids decrease the inflammation that was leading to lungs getting destroyed? And what we did was we did a study and we found out that in patients with mild to moderate pneumocystis, early oral steroids were helpful. Steroids in patients who are on oxygen or fairly sick with COVID have been proven in a large trial to be helpful. I, do, I give steroids to people with bad allergies or allergic reactions. I do not give them to people for just a routine, uncomplicated viral infection. Steroids calm down the inflammation and sometimes people get manic from them. And so they feel better. They're like, I love those steroids. I always felt better on steroids. It's like, well, you felt better because you were maybe a little high from it. But um, sometime I'll do the talk on all the president's meds because he was definitely having a steroid rage there right after he got, he got high dose steroids. In the, but anyway, we digress. Um, so I would say no, the answer is no, I don't. And, and I do think there's sort of an old fashioned, get them out of the clinic and make them feel better. You know, it's like my mother used to get B12 shots when she felt tired and it was a complete ripoff from her doctor. He was just making some money charging her for a B12 shot. I mean, you know, so I would say no. And I think there is there is significant downside, especially with people with diabetes, hypertension, it increases 
um, fluid retention, can make hypertension worse, can obviously make blood sugars worse. I would say proceed cautiously. That being said, I give steroids a lot because I'm a pulmonologist and I have a lot of asthma and allergic patients. And I think it's appropriate for those patients. Thanks, that's great. Thank you so much, Dr. Doyle. Well, again, thank you guys. I can't believe I ran over. I wanted to have more time for questions. All right, well, go forth and, and uh, do a great, do the great job you're doing and think about